Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our last, last wellness lecture of this wellness lecture series. We're glad to have you. First announcement is, for, uh, for this lecture, we have a lot of seats in the, in the front, and uh, uh, Ginny brought up a really great point. It, the front row was reserved for people with low vision, and we also wanted to include people with low vision and their spouses. So you don't have to separate. If you have a spouse and you actually wanted to sit with them, come on up. It's okay. It's okay. We don't want you to separate just because you don't have a vision issue, okay? All right, so welcome everybody. We're glad you're here. And welcome to our last lecture. A couple of housekeeping items that we'd like to share with you is um, this, pre this presentation is being recorded, and so we ask that if you do have a device on you, a telephone, a cell phone, please turn it on mute so it doesn't go off during the presentation. Um, if we have questions during the presentation, we're going to try again to hold the questions um, till the end so we can capture them on the audio at the end. Um, if a question does come up, we're going to ask that the questions be repeated by our presenters so that they can, we can capture the, the answers. I'm sorry. And for our last question, or for our last presentation, we're going to go through our lovely scenario with our lovely case study, uh, explaining our case study. One more time. Remember, this entire series is based on one case study that we're following through from the lens of a subject matter expert. So we're, this week, we're going to look at it from the vantage point of vision loss. And Lighthouse for the Blind will be speaking to that. So again, I will be reading our case study. Case study, Lee Mann is an 86-year-old widowed female resident in the independent apartments at New Day Village, a continuing care retirement community. Lee has lived in New Day Village for the past two years. Lee was employed as a social worker in the public schools. She's enjoyed world travel, hiking with her partner, who died eight years ago. Lee has, a, has macular degeneration, which continues to worsen over time, as well as hearing loss, she has hearing aids, but doesn't like to use them because they're uncomfortable, and it's really difficult to change the batteries. Like others in her community, Lee was isolated from family, friends, and limited in following her interest during the last 18 months of quarantine. As the quarantine restrictions lift, Lee admits to a marked decline in strength and balance due to limitations in her abilities to exercise. As her vision declines, she feels less safe going on public walks unless she's accompanied by a friend or family member. Lee admits to a few select staff members that she's having trouble remembering things. I keep losing my checkbook. I don't know where I put those notes from the doctor's office. And she has less patience with learning new things. They installed a washer and dryer that is too high technology for me to understand. Why can't the machine just turn on and off? Yeah. 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 Amen. <laughs> she regrets giving up her car when she moved in, but knows that her vision issues were becoming a liability. She is frustrated by the logistics of setting up transportation, making appointments, managing grocery orders, communicating with healthcare providers and other services, and would rather not leave the apartment because it's just too difficult to navigate outside the building. So her issues, she's a newish resident that moved in prior to the pandemic. She has ongoing grief and readjustment concerns. She has worsening macular degeneration that limits activities and exercise she used to enjoy, like walking, hiking, and traveling. She has hearing loss with discomfort over use and care of her hearing aids. She admits to a decrease in strength and balance related to quarantine. She admits to increase in trouble remembering things. And she has, had, has, she has not had much opportunity to build a support network in the community and is at, at increased risk of isolation and depression. 
So with that, I'm going to bring up Jenny Stimson to introduce our guest today. Jenny? Thank you, Erica. That was wonderful. Um, today's program is called Building a Low Vision Supportive Community because each Horizon House resident and staff member plays a part in making this place of, um, we live in accessible and friendly for those with sight challenges. Lynn St. Pierre um, has come today to help us understand how we might do that. Lynn is a certified orientation and mobility specialist with the Lighthouse for the Blind. She earned her BA in psychology at the University of Washington and brings over 30 years of wellness work in health and wellness to her role in the independent living program. Lynn provides hands-on support for her patients in various stages of vision loss, aiding them in realizing their full potential. And I think that's what many of us who are losing our sight want, is we want to do the most that we can with what we have. The Lighthouse for the Blind is a contractor for independent living program, a program for people with vision impairments who are not pursuing a career, and this is offered by the Department of Services for the Blind. In Lynn's previous talk to Horizon House, which was via Zoom, um, we got to have a conversation, but we hadn't met in person until today. Lynn described that low vision assessments are different from eye exams. They help determine how to use vision, the vision we have, in the best way to accomplish what we want to do. One goal of Lynn's work is to help us do that, to do what we want to accomplish with the vision we have. She will come to our residences and help assess what supports might serve what we want to accomplish. Lynn follows up on her first visit with a second one that allows her to bring a selection of products for a person to test out. One thing I learned from Lynn's last talk was that the product that works well for one person might not be the product that works well for another person. And that's part about learning about what people's goals and um, desires are. I think that's really important to learn because I was assuming if we just got the list of the correct products and put it on the website, that would be a help. But it's not that simple. Lynn is also willing to give feedback on the purchases that we make here at Horizon House. And Eli is open to contacting them, and I'm excited about that. And having said that and written that this week, I want to tell you, I was the one that arranged for the new clocks in the swimming pool, and already I've heard from my friends that they don't work for people with low vision. Dang it, why didn't I call them? So, uh, But I just talked with Leanne on the way here, and Leanne was giving me some ideas how we can improve that. So. I just think, why don't I listen to what I'm writing her? <laughs> anyway, it, it will be improved. Leanne Stevens is here also with us today, and she manages the low vision services uh, at the Lighthouse for the Blind, which include the Independent Living Program, the Low Vision Clinic, and our Low Vision Store. She has been at the Lighthouse for over five years and has been very hands-on with the startup of their low vision services. She has been in an employee, employee and community services program um, for over five years serving individuals that are blind, deafblind, or blind with other disabilities. Let us now how, learn how we can become a low vision supportive community. Thank you to the two of you for coming today. Good afternoon. I'm Lynn St. Pierre, and um, Jenny, I need to like hire you to go around and announce who I am and all of my um, amazing abilities. <laughs> because <laughs> because I, I read uh, this morning, she sent me, this is how I'm going to introduce you, and I'm like, oh wow, I guess I might know something. <laughs> um, and um, I'm going to let Leanne um, come and introduce herself. Bring it down. Hi everyone, I'm Leanne Stevens. 
Um, thank you so much for having us. Uh, we are looking forward to the presentation. Um, as Jeannie had mentioned, I am from the Lighthouse. I've been there for five years, um, and I oversee the Low Vision Services. Um, which include the independent living program, low vision clinic, and the low vision store. Um, so we'll start off uh, kind of talking about the lighthouse um, to get everyone familiar if you're not familiar. Um, Lynn will take it from there and talk all about the independent living program. And then we'll be able to talk about the low vision clinic and the store that we have. So the independent living program, um, Lighthouse for the Blind is a contractor with the state to provide services for people who have vision impairments who are 23 years or older, I think all of you qualify for that one, um, and that are not pursuing a career or have goals for a job. Um, so we call it non-vocational. And um, I love this program because there are very few hoops to jump through. You don't have to prove that you're legally blind. You don't need to prove that you have a certain amount of vision. You could to call and say, my vision is giving me problems. And then we come and do an assessment and take a look at ways that um, you might be able to change what you do. Um, and Lighthouse for the Blind um, is a private, not-for-profit social enterprise providing employment support and training opportunities for people who are blind, <laughs> deaf-blind, and blind with other disabilities. The Lighthouse has provided employment and support to people who are blind in our community since 1918. So this is a hundred, it's coming up on 103 years, and with the whole emphasis of, um, of providing, um, providing employment support for people with vision impairments. And this is really important because the unemployment or underemployment of people with vision impairments is about 70% throughout the nation. And so this is um, such an important thing because there are people that are highly skilled and just need a little extra support. Um, so I, when I read this, I had to look it up. Um, social enterprise. And it's like, what? <laughs> and so, you know, I, we are a nonprofit, which means our pro it, it doesn't mean we make profits because we, we make things and we build things, but all of those profits go back into Lighthouse for the Blind to support and promote people through um, to get better employment. All right, so I just wanted to talk a little bit more about the Lighthouse. Um, as Lynn had mentioned, it started in 1918. Um, we weren't in our current location, which we are located um, right on Plum Street now, um, but they started by making brooms. And now we have a different um, manufacturing. So we don't just, we don't make brooms, but we now make um, aerospace parts. So we have people who are making airplane parts. We have contracts with governments. We make military supplies. And we also have contracts with the NIB. Um, and so we have definitely grown in size. Um, and as Lynn had mentioned, the services and the sales and, or any sort of profit does go back into the company, um, which, makes it, which makes us able to provide the services to our employees. And now we're able to now offer these services to our community. Um, and that's what we're doing with the Low Vision Services. What is NIB? It's the National Industry for the Blind. 
So um, a lot of the times with the contracts that we have, so especially that one, um, we create office supplies or we manufacture office supplies. And so what happens is that uh, the people who are associated with the NIB, um, they will purchase through us before going out to external sources. So we're able to keep that cycle going with the nonprofits around. I find it fascinating to go down to the ground floor of Lighthouse for the Blind and walk through it because it's a full machine shop and there are things being cut and ground and made um, many um, of the smaller parts for Boeing planes um, get made down there. We also have a um, contract with the U.S. military to make um, canteens, these shovels that fold up so they're compact, and um, stretchers so that um, if, if a soldier is down, they can be pulled off. Um, we have here um, a woman whose husband was the um, chairman of Light of uh, the board for Lighthouse for the Blind. Um, Jenny, would you mind coming up and introducing? So when we were planning this program, we talked with Judy and Bruce Walker about talking about their experience because um, Bruce was the chair of the board of directors for a long time there and has a long experience with them. But unfortunately, they haven't been feeling at the top of their game lately. So they're here as a support in person. But just so you know, as a contact person, if you wanted to learn more, we have people here that know quite a bit about this, the operation. Thank you for your service to the community. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Um, reading for Pleasure, um, there's Washington Talking Book and Braille Library that can be helpful and also, um, you know, they're not the only game in town now. There's, you know, certainly um, books you can download from the library and other places. So being able to use those, um, those machines to do that. And then um, being able to tell time and get the right magnification into your hands. Um, so many times I've gone in and said, oh, my family member got the strongest magnifier off Amazon. And nothing against Amazon, honestly. But their strongest magnifier is weaker than my weakest. And so people will say, I, magnifiers don't work anymore. That's, it's, it's done. And I say, well, let's take a look. Let's do an assessment. Um, and it's like, oh, well, you need this strength. Um, and so that is, um, you may, you probably will not be able to read a whole book that way because it is a little limiting, but you'll be able to see what your bill is. You'll be able to see um, what somebody wrote in a card, uh, things like that. The, I, I call it survival reading, um, being able to do that. And then the last area, um, which is the area that I have my original training in, is orientation and mobility. This is the best job that nobody knows about. I love it. And it is really looking at the safety and efficacy of travel for people. You know, are they able to get around in a safe way? Are they able to get around in a way that they're not having to go out of their way to get places. And that's, you know, and being able to um, access um, Metro's access, being able to use Metro's access, and also um, being able to maybe use um, a rideshare app or, or get a taxi, and then be able to keep track of where they are so that they can get out and do things. Um, you know, I. I'd like to go over the case study at this point, now that I've talked about the three areas. And, um, you know, this I, case studies, uh, you, you get to make this stuff up a little bit. So, you know, I'm going down this list and I'm like, oh, what would I do here? Um, so, um, the, so, Lee Mann is, um, at, she has macular degeneration. And um, we'll have a slide about this, but it means the central part of her vision is gone. And so we would um, maybe look at um, making things a little bit larger so that she, we can, she can see it. Um, she might also, when she goes outside, it's, the glare might just really hurt her eyes. Or the glare inside, um, she might keep her blinds shut and things kind of dark because the sun coming through her window um, is just too much. And so we'd look at um, what we call sun filters, which really do look like um, sunglasses, but they're very specific colors. And you know they filter out certain parts of the sun ray that is causing problems with glare. And then, um, hold on, I should have highlighted this. Um, you know, being able to go outside and feel safe. Um, you know, she may she may feel like I'm not sure where that curb is, or if if there's a little step down and I can't see that. And so I would talk to her about using what we call a long white cane, which is very different than a support cane, uh, because the long white cane goes out in front and scans what is happening in front. You know, are, is there a rug that is up front? Is there a change in, um, does it go from gravel to concrete? Um, it gives people a warning of what's coming up, um, what they call a path preview. So they preview what's ahead in their path. Um, and it does a second thing. It actually does three things. The second thing is that it gives others um, a heads up that there is, that you have a vision impairment, that Lee has a vision impairment. And so when she walks down the hall and somebody says hi, 
and she doesn't say hi, you know, say, oh, hi, Shirley, you know, it, it Shirley might think that, like, Lee might just not be real friendly. Um, so it gives a clue, and people make some accommodations. You know, drivers will see that and realize they're not going to react in the same way. And the third is that um, uh, there are white cane laws um, throughout the nation, and it is if you have this white cane, um, I, I always think this is so backwards. We should, you know, we, you know, it makes you more visible. But if something were to happen and um, somebody were to cause an accident with, with you, um, the the ramifications are much greater. So. Um, so people, drivers, tend to be more cautious around people with white canes. Um, you know, and then there was a couple things in here. You know, she says, oh, I can't remember where I left the checkbook, or I can't remember where I put those notes. And it could be a memory problem. And, you know, your, your speaker that came and talked about memory problems would, would probably say, oh, that we would assess for that. But I would also assess and take a look at, do you have a system for putting things um, in places where you know where you can find them? Um, we all forget where we put things, but we look around and we see, oh, there's that, um, there's that little edge of the, the checkbook. Now I know where it is. Um, you know, doing things like changing the checkbook cover so it's bright red or bright orange so that it's easier to see or setting up a workstation if um, if she needs like a place where to always put her notes and to always put her checkbook um, because it's really hard with um, low vision to be able to look everywhere and see everywhere. Um, and then the washer and dryer. Um, we, um, we go in and we look at um, are there are are there things that we can do? And one of the one of the best things, and it's so low tech, is what we call bump dots, and um, they or locator dots, and they're little stickers, but they're raised up, and they have different shapes, they're different sizes, they're different textures, and um, you, you might just need to know where the on button is on your microwave. Those microwaves with a nice flat surface and there's no little buttons. You can't like count two buttons down and one over and that's the five. Um, but be able to go in and mark the buttons that are important. So we might be able to mark the buttons on her appliances so that it doesn't feel so much like um, it's a big mystery. Um, for microwaves, I call it the poke and hope. Like you, you, you push and you just hope it's the right one that you know you have 30 seconds, not three minutes, <laughs> you know, with something. So um, it gives you much more accuracy. Terms and definitions, we had to do it right. <laughs> So I've been talking about low vision, and you know, what is low vision? Low vision is the loss of sight that is not corrected with prescription eyeglasses, contact lenses, or surgery. This type of vision loss does not include complete blindness uh, because there is still some sight and it can sometimes be improved with the use of visual aids. And so it can be both acuity, like are you 2200? Or it can be loss of field, which means there's part of your vision that you just can that's gone. And so um, both of those would be considered low vision. Legal blindness. Now legal blindness is low vision, <laughs> but, um, but they decided to uh, put a threshold there. Um, the person has vis visual acuity no better than 2200 with conventional correction or a restricted field of less than 20 degrees wide, which is if you hold a fist out and you, you figure everything that would be in your fist if you do one eye, that's about how much you can see. So, um, 
So it's a pretty narrow field. You can see all of this, but not all of that. Um, and so um, usually people can only see the big E with the better eye, best vision, nothing smaller than that big E that's always at the top of the, um, the vision chart. And then there's total blindness. Um, a complete lack of light perception and form, form perception, which means you can't see like the form of a person. Um, sometimes they call it no light perception, NLP. Um, and you know, very few people today are totally blind. In fact, 85% of all individuals with eye disorders have some remaining sight approximately 15% are blind. So when people say, oh, you work with a blind, you know, I, I'll say, I, I, and then they'll say, oh, they can't see anything. And I'll say, oh, most of them can actually. And we just have to figure out what they can see and where their vision is letting them down. I just realized I can use the arrow keys because <laughs> somehow my touch is not working. Um, so people say, what are the most common eye conditions? And the number one is age-related macular degeneration, or ARMD is how it is the medical people um, abbreviate it. Um, the largest loss of sight in people over 60 in the US. It affects central vision only. Peripheral vision remains largely intact. And so reading, driving, recognizing people is really hard. It's our what is it vision. And it's, you know, it, it, it's, if you're trying to figure out what is this, you're using that central part of your vision because that's where you used to do it. And the macula is the best place to get the, the most um, detailed vision. But with macular degeneration, that, or that area has been impaired. And so um, it, you know, we call it the what is it vision. You'll see there's a series here with the <laughs> glaucoma. Um, affects peripheral vision first, typically, but not always. Um, due to a buildup of pressure that usually goes unnoticed for quite a while. Um, walking, moving safely through the environment are the problems. And it's the where, where is it vision. And that makes some sense because, you know, you can be going along the street and you can see right straight ahead, but all that stuff from slightly midline over can be very blurred. And so finding where it is means that you're having to use that little area in your central vision. Diabetic retinopathy. So this vision, uh, the losses are kind of patchy, uh, which means it can be like a little splotch here and a little splotch there. Um, it, um, it can be fluctuating. It can fluctuate with your blood sugar. and this one can lead to total blindness. Um, this is um, kind of the leading cause of total blindness, is diabetic retinopathy. And then stroke. Um, a stroke does not have to affect uh, vision. You know, a stroke always affects a portion of the brain, and so sometimes it has to do with one side of the body. Um, but we, we tend to see um, a loss of visual field in both eyes. And when you lose that visual field, it's black in those areas. There's nothing there. And so, um, so it, it is sort of a partial thing. It's like in areas you'll have really good vision, in other areas, absolutely nothing. All right, so, <laughs> I love this part, the four Bs. Um, we we um, talk about different um, different ways to um, take a look at how to 
work with the vision that you have. So different strategies for working with the vision that you have. I am going to hold up some items. I will do a verbal description of them and, um, and talk about why I'm choosing this. So the first one, the first one, oops. Orientation. <laughs> yes, I, I, I failed on half of my job description there. <laughs> the first one is bigger. And I'm holding up a calendar that is about, oh, 18 inches wide by hmm, 25 inches long. And each of the squares are about three inches long by about inch and a half wide. And so, and it's, and the numbers are really bold. It's dark, dark black on um, white. I mean, don't you love those beautiful calendars that have, you know, all of the, it has beautiful photos and then they have these tiny little boxes and they have, light gray numbers <laughs> and it's hard because they're beautiful you want to use them um, but functionality is a little on the the minimum the other way that we make things bigger is magnification and I'm holding up what we call a stand magnifier and it's a little different than the um, the Clouseau, um, you know, Sherlock Holmes magnifier, in that it's, re it's really nice because it rests on the paper. And so if you have a tremor, if you, are, if you have some weakness, um, you don't have to hold everything up in perfect alignment. You're able to set this down and be able to just bring it across the page. And we will make it we can make it big enough so that um, you should be able to um, read what it is. I'm trying to remember. Oops. I thought there was one for each of the bees. <laughs> Brighter. Um, so we take, we look at um, lighting in your home apartment. We look at lighting for your kitchen countertop. We look for lighting in your desk area. And, we, and it's very interesting. Each of these um, types of eye diseases sometimes need a little different lighting. You know, macular degeneration, lighting is great as long as it's pointed right down to where it needs to be. And maybe not too bright or maybe very bright. So the intensity and how it's focused um, is very important. Um, Boulder, um, that calendar you saw, big bold numbers. But one of my other favorite things is a cutting board that is white on one side, black on the other. And it's fabulous because if you have onions that you're trying to chop up, and most, and most cutting boards, these plastic, you know, nylon, nylon ones, are white. White onions on a white board, hmm. <laughs> but if you flip it over to the black side, then there's that contrast. And so contrast is part of the boulder. You got meat for stew, flip it over to white, you know, because it's beef and it's a dark red. You would lose it on the black side. And so, um, and you know, I would probably bring in a task light to put over this so that you have the very best lighting for you and try to increase the contrast. And then there's bumpier. And um, I have to say, probably one of the hardest things to do because people are in love with their vision. They're in love with it. And they should be, because your vision, the, when, you're, when you see something and it goes back to your brain, those nerves, it's like a superhighway. 
and it has served you for years and years. And then, you know what? Your vision tries to break up with you. And you're like, yeah, I don't know. I know you're trying to break up with me, but like, what if I only use it when, um, in the morning, when it's best? You know, are you gonna break up with me? And you know, vision will say, oh, I'll stick around for a little bit. And then it's like, no. Well, what if I only use it? <laughs> <laughs> and it at some point it kind of becomes like a bad relationship <laughs> and um, you you need some other strategies so using other senses and one of the senses is being able to feel things versus see things and I, I don't want to say it's just as simple as putting your hands out because um, you need to practice it because guess what the superhighway, that's your eyes to your brain, your, your tactile, your fingers to your brain, it's kind of like a nice country road. You know, you can go down it, and it's not, you know, you can't go very fast, but, you know, it gets you there. But, you know, the more you use tactile, the more you start building a superhighway from your fingertips to your brain. And so, um, I, like I said, it's it is just one of the more difficult ones for people to do because you have to you have to build a new highway. <laughs> it's not just oh well I'll just change up how I do the lighting and I'll use that same tactic vision. So um, and it's re but it's really important to to be able to do that because some days you have good vision days and some days are bad vision days and to have a backup plan is imperative. <laughs> Hold on, let me, s oh. And then, you know, this doesn't, this doesn't uh, probably fit into any of the four Bs. I think we need to find a five B, a fifth B for this. And um, I'm holding up um, a long white cane. I talked about this earlier, why this was such a good idea. Um, so when it folds up, it's about 10 inches um, long. And it has an elastic cord that goes all the way from the handle down to the tip. And then you can release it. And then, I, you, and so this comes up right about to where my, my, sorry, this goes up almost to where my collarbone is. So this can is actually a good height for me. This is a good length for my height. And so people are always like, wait, that's, that's much longer than the other cane. And it's because if, with, when I have this cane, if I were blindfolded and walking, I would have between two to three steps of notice that there's something ahead. I have to get around. There's something ahead I need to step down or up. And so um, it doesn't fit into the five Bs, but it is certainly um, a really important um, piece of equipment for those that have vision that puts them at some um, that really puts them at some um, boy <laughs> my last sentence and this is where I can't remember a word danger there <laughs> you know it puts them at some danger to not be able to see what's ahead of them all right there is the thank you which means Leanne gets to come back up. <laughs> Hello again. Um, so I just wanted to talk about a couple of other services that we have uh, for our low vision services. Um, so we do have our low vision clinic and we do have some handouts. Um, so on the handouts that we'll leave for everyone to grab will be contact information that will vary. So we'll have low vision service phone number available, which um, is directed a lot more towards the independent living program that Lynn was discussing. There'll be a phone number for our low vision store. Um, so inside the low vision store is where you'll be able to purchase um, many low vision devices that range from um, home management to basic wall clocks, like Jeannie had mentioned. Um, and those are high contrast, really good for low vision. 
Um, unfortunately, right now our store is not open to the public, but we are taking phone orders. So I just want to let everyone know that's why I wanted to share the phone number. Um, we are expecting to have our catalog available online um, for those who are interested. Um, and then once that's available, I think we're planning for the end of fall. So considering we're in October, I'm thinking by the end of November <laughs> to throw out a time. Um, but if you, you know, would like a recommendation on low vision products, we do have the sources. Um, we have a low vision optometrist and that's what she specializes in, is her is low vision. Um, she is amazing, and she's the one who um, does the low vision evaluations within the clinic. And then we also have an occupational therapist who's available to do additional training. Um, training from um, assistive technology devices all the way to computer devices that are available on your screens. Um, so that leads us into the clinic. And so as Lynn had mentioned, the low vision clinic, um, it's not like your typical eye exam. Low vision um, evaluations, we do the evaluation, you meet with the doctor, you do um, discuss your daily goals, and then what she'll do is she will assess and she'll prescribe um, devices that will help meet these goals. And they can range depending on what you're looking to do from magnification to lighting to um, hand magnifiers, things along those lines. Um, being that we are a low vision clinic and we are considered a specialist, we are referral based only. So on the paper that's available, because um, I do get a lot of, what do we need to bring? What, what do I need to get in? Um, it starts with your doctor. So when you go in and you go see your doctor, um, a lot of the times what, he'll, what they'll do is they would um, send a referral over to us. Um, and it's listed in there what documents we would need to, to get you scheduled and moving forward through the low vision process through the clinic. Um, so on the form, it's a yellow form with black bold writing. There is writing on both sides. One side, um, as I mentioned, has the low vision services phone number, as well as the low vision store phone number. And on the back is uh, the low vision clinic and including everything that we would need to get you scheduled. Um, if there is questions, you can definitely call the clinic and we could answer those for you. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's it. Um, it all intertwines, so thank you so much for your time. We are going to leave up here a um, um, a richness of <laughs> printed material, and I always say it's it's a bit of like a low vision people would give you printed material. You know, it's like a cosmic joke or something. But you know, it's I I think that it's good to have it. Um, first of all, you might call us for a magnifier. <laughs> to see it, but also so that you can um, share it with friends and family, so they might understand a little bit better. So we have um, we have um, printouts about the four conditions I talked about today. We also have brochures for the low vision services at Lighthouse for the Blind, and the independent living program um, that um, we provide services through. So um, and then in kind of like a buff yellowish color. This is where you'll find all of the phone numbers in large, dark <laughs> um, print, and um, also the list of things that you need to get from your doctor to be able to see, um, be seen in the low vision clinic. And we're just going to leave it here, and Erica will have access to them um, after the talk, if you think of something. So I will have the resources as well. Um, so if you have any questions, I can you can follow up with me, and I'll help you with that. I don't seem to have a microphone. No. Um, so we'll do our question and answer, and I'll just point to people. But a quick question for you two to start with, though, is is um, so does Medicare cover this? You can take your mask. Oh, sorry. That is a great question. Um, so going to the clinic, we do run through insurance. We do accept Medicare. Um, and so we do accept some private insurance as well. 
Um, what I would recommend and what we do recommend to patients coming in is that you reach out to your insurance provider and just make sure we are covered um, to come and receive the services. Um, as far as devices, those are typically not covered as well because um, it is ran through medical. Um, but that's where, you know, if there is a time where funds, you know, funds are hard to come across or, you know, a little bit too expensive, because as we know, devices, they are pretty costly. Um, sometimes we can supplement and start with the independent living program. So we do have other options. Um, and then another thing is that we have, um, as the Lighthouse, we do not deny services to anyone. Um, so if somebody's not, if they don't have insurance, if they're not able to meet the requirements for the independent living program, we are able to still see them. And what we do, and this is a lot of, it kind of opens up the door to share more information about our department, is that um, we started a grant list. And so we have donors that help supplements for some of these funds. Um, so that's one thing too. So no, everyone is able to get services in the community. Um, so we are able to see everyone. Um, so yeah, that's That's excellent. And so second follow-up question to that, do you also have a, a donor closet? Do you give donations and take donations? <laughs> Great question. Um, yes, we do take donations. Um, as far as giving, we, like I said, in our services, we're able to offer those without denying anyone. So anyone that is referred over to the clinic is able to be seen. Any questions in the audience? Back there. Nowhere did I see any mention of service dogs for the blunt. <laughs> the mask going on and off. Um, you know, service dogs are a really integral part for a very small minority of people. Um, I think only 2% or 3% of people who are blind um, have service dogs. Um, I have had three clients um, that have wanted service dogs and needed um, training to do it, and um, all three of those people were um, were granted service dogs, um, so um, or uh, eye dogs, seeing eye dogs, um, which is specifically the type of service dog that is used. Um, there's and there are a number of schools. Guide dog for the blind um, is probably one of the best, and it has a training center down in. Boring Oregon. <laughs> it's a real place. <laughs> um, and you know they have um, very specific trainers. Once they get a dog, um, if they have problems, um, it's really out of my um, my knowledge, my base of knowledge. But um, once uh, a, a good guide school um, will um, support both the handler and the dog um, for the life of that team. So um, they're the ones that provide um, provide that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Right up here. Microphone's coming to you. Oh, I can. I, I can oh, pop. we need to hear it for the. Uh, oh, okay. here it comes. Where can I get one of those big calendars that you showed us? <laughs> Great question. <laughs> So the calendars are available at our Low Vision Service um, store. So um, I would encourage you to just give us a call and what we would be able to do um, is we don't expect people to come in, but we would do the transaction over the phone. We take credit or debit cards um, and then we ship it directly to your location so you don't have to go anywhere. So what's your phone number? We have it right here. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. I also. Oh, sorry, I, I also wanted to mention, um, along with the services that we have, we just implemented in February our um, donated CCTV program. Um, so this, well, I'm not letting you 
talk about it. Um, so this is offered to our community members um, for those who may be interested in the CCTVs. Um, and we get them donated and then we're able to actually turn around and provide those services or the CCTVs to those who may not be able to afford them. So it's a great program um, in and out. What is it? I, yeah, that, I, 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 <laughs> I was trying to get to the microphone. <laughs> um, so CCTVs, um, I really wish, we're starting to call video magnifiers. And so what it is is um, a, a camera that's pointed down at um, a tabletop uh, thing that moves. <laughs> and then there's really good magnification and usually a fairly large screen that it takes takes the picture and it puts it up on the screen. So uh, mag so magnification can happen in two ways. One is with glass, and you know the handheld magnifier that I brought out um, is an example of that. But um, CCTVs or video magnifiers can either be desktop, and so they're quite large. They would take up a fair bit of this podium that's up here, um, or they can be handheld. Um, they obviously have much smaller screens, um, but would be great for you know checking out what um, you know how long to heat that microwave meal or um, you know some smaller bit of reading. Um, so we um, so if you call the low vision. Um, number that's on that buff colored um, thing we could talk to you. you can apply for one we have a very limited amount um, so we sort of meet as a team and we try to take a look at um, needs and the the equipment that we have and we try to do try to find a happy marriage between people and if you know anybody that has one and it's no longer of any use to them um, we will come, we will take it and make sure that it's working great and turn around and um, send it back out into the community. We have two here in the library that are available. We do? That are just that are not used? Not, They're, no, where people go to the library. Oh, good. Oh, and you guys, oh, okay, you have two in your library um, that are available. And so, to use there. yes, to use there because they're big. And if they're big, they're heavy. I can tell you this because I've moved them. <laughs> what does CC stand for? Oh, it's closed caption TV, which always makes it sound like you're spying on your neighbors or something. Um, <laughs> because there are CCTVs for, um, you know, to see if, like, if there's anybody around your outdoors or something. Um, and it, I mean, it just is the same thing. It's, it's a TV image that is just for you. It's closed, ca it's not closed caption, closed. Closed circuit. Closed circuit, thank you. <laughs> There's another CC in there. Question over there. I have a new business for you. You can manufacture dials <laughs> to put on appliances that could be red, <laughs> bold, and brighter instead of the ones we get, because no appliance has magnification on them at all. They produce for the total population, not for the elderly population who need some eyesight problems. You know, that's great. Although, give me a package of bump dots and your, your oven and we'll be in business. <laughs> and it would be under 15 bucks. <laughs> Any questions? Oh, question right here with Jenny, right at the front. Right. Mm -hmm. Microphone, right up here. Somebody with a microphone. Oh, Sue's coming up. That's all right. Jenny and then, yeah, Jenny and then John. When people are wanting a certain tool that they've heard is available at the state, for instance, the um, closed caption phones that you can get from the state, do you help link people to those resources? Yeah, that's, um, that's a program called I Can Connect, 
and it is for people who are have dual impairments of vision and hearing both. Um, and um, I certainly I can connect them with those services. They they do an assessment of their own. Um, they don't take my assessment, and they make determinations whether the person qualifies for this. And um, it it's a it's a great program uh, because they do have equipment that can help with both hearing and vision. There are people here that have those that just say it's made the difference for them, and other people wonder how to get a hold of them. So it's I Can Connect, and their offices are on the University of Washington campus. <laughs> and um, Jenny, if you want to email me, I will um, send you the contact information for that. Yeah. Or, yeah. Thank you. So I have um, not a question, but an observation. CCTV is confusing. Closed caption. As I, have, uh, as I thought you were going to talk about, is the, is the one that has scrolling of stuff across the screen when we're watching television or a movie. Yeah. Yeah. And all the dialogue is there, and that is, in my mind, CCTV and maybe the, that of other members here in the audience here. And you're talking about a device that projects, that can, shoots a camera down at a, at a tabletop and reads a book or a newspaper, or magnifies a book or a newspaper for people to see, and I think Am I correct that those are the two possibles, or is there a third possible for that definition? You know, um, and it's, I, I totally, I, misp I misspoke. Um, the, the CCTVs are just the magnification, um, but you are right. There is something called OCR, which is optical character recognition, which means it can read characters being letters. Um, and. Um, and this is, it's a, a little more rare in the, this world, but it's cert they're certainly out there. And for people that their vision just really doesn't work well, even with um, things magnified huge, um, or they need something that is a lot more efficient, um, the, 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 <laughs> the video magnifiers with the speech um, is also an option, or the OCR. And the other version of CCTV is, is like what we have at our front desk where the, the reception person can see all these little camera places around, and we have cameras, closed circuit television. Um, right, right, your receptionist also, has a version of like CCTV that is like making sure that like hallways are safe and, and who's coming in and out. Uh, well, we're used to come in out the front door and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, you're right. There, there is that version, um, but ours has magnification. That's why I really think we should just start calling them video magnifiers. And um, but CCTV just like rolls off your tongue so easily. You just want to be able to say it. <laughs> Any other questions at this point? So at this point, let's give a round of applause to our guests today. And um, before we all leave, I want to um, bring up our, uh, our people that made this happen. Sue Shaw, Jenny Stimson, and uh, Mary Kenny. Would you please come up? These were the three people that really spearheaded this entire event. Uh, making the a, a marriage of the wellness committee and the uh, low vision and hearing challenge committees, uh, making this uh, whole production happen. This is the end of our wellness lecture series, and um, I think if uh, if you liked what you saw here, you owe them a debt of gratitude for making this happen. So. Well, I'm here to um, because we owe others a debt of gratitude for making this happen. And the first one on our list is Carrie. 
and um, without his help, uh, we really couldn't have made the YouTube films that are available. And starting tomorrow, those four YouTube programs will be on HH Connect. So you'll be able to share them with your family. Uh, you can uh, rewatch things that you may have missed uh, during the presentations. And it will, uh, it, we really appreciate that, Carrie. So if you'd step up here for just a minute, I'd like to give you a little gift in appreciation for your efforts. <laughs> about people in the community that are doing things that can be a service for us and I hope that you know that you can go to Erica to ask some of the questions that we ask of, um, the people here because she knows who to go to out in the community so Erica comes to our committee meetings and contributes but we have lots of little coffee clutch meetings too and she gives us advice and as I said connects us to people and um, she's been such a gift um, in addition um, thank you, Erica. Thank you. Thank you all for coming today. And I, I'd like to see a show of hands of anyone who attended all four sessions. I would love to talk with each of you and um, if you will call me at 2788 in the next couple of days I'll be around and I'd like to connect with as many of you as possible who were here for all four sessions to give just to give us an idea of what worked what didn't work and uh, how we might make this uh, better the next time were you thank you so were much you, for being here today the first one.